<laughs> That's why I like these barriers. Um, okay, so um, well, welcome. I just have to say, like with uh, the Gibson, you like, who knew, Jack? Wow, look at this group. It's great. Um, so, maybe I can this very loud. Can you hear me if I talk like this? Is that okay? Okay, so, um, well, I actually put this together. I actually had no idea what I was going to talk about. Um, and then Bobby Adams told me he had extra slides and if he could give them to me. And I said, thank you, Bobby. <laughs> and uh, then last night, after a couple of beers, I wrote this. Oh, <laughs> <Long> disclosure. <laughs> And so, and I've become like many of us who study things for a long time, kind of interested in the history and stuff. And so, one of the things, that, and my husband likes to buy historical books to be my habit. And um, so, he got this book by Benson Lawson um, about the Hudson. If you haven't seen it, it's a great book. And there's this photograph in the book with, which I torture my fishery class with every fall. And they, make, they have to look at this, and they see a sturgeon. A, uh, a striped bass and a shad, and this is with you know this. Uh, there, here's the eight, the yards and yards and yards of nets that they would put out somewhere in the Catskills, so I guess in the up in the Hudson. And you see this little asterisk over here. So the asterisk actually, if you go down to the fine print, it says that these fish are portrayed in their relative size, their correct relative size. So in other words, if this is about a six or six foot or two meter sturgeon, this is probably a one meter shack. And this little weedy guy here <laughs> is a striped bass, okay? So things have changed, obviously, and I think there are a lot of things, as people have said today, we don't always know, we're li we live in a moment, and we don't know the full sweep and repertoire of how things work. One thing that some of you may not be aware of is that the transactions of the American Fishery Society, which was called the transactions of the uh, progressive fish culturists, I think, or the American fish culturists, in 1870, the first issue, volume one, issue one, had an article about shad. Shad was so important, um, and you can see it's got very complimentary text about it. And uh, it also, I also noticed in this first uh, thing that they say, um, I have eaten shad, as fine shad from other places before the race became extinct. So extinction has been going on, um, and people have noticed that. And the, you can even read that in articles from the late 1800s, where they bemoan the loss of shad and river herring. This is from a paper I did a long time ago um, on um, uh, uh, American shad in a state of range, just trying to summarize what rivers we knew were, um, shad had used and what we knew at the time seemed to be what they were using. And it was a decline. We also added up uh, the amount of, of access that was lost, and that was amounted to about 4,000 uh, kilometers of loss of habitat across the East Coast. And I'm not going to go into the phenology of shad here, except to say that shad, the Elosine, are a, a group uh, that have, are characterized by pretty large geographic ranges. And the American shad range is uh, basically from Florida up into the Maritimes, and, um, and still, still is. And uh, that they have sort of, they've had a, historically in our time, anyway, a, a sort of a, a southerly to northerly progression of spawning and, and you know, spawning seasons and so on. Uh, they have some of the coolest, besides the eels, they have some of the coolest life history. Um, books have been written about uh, the things that they do, and the more I study them, the more I'm amazed about their different, they and the river herrings in general, about their plastic migrations and so on. This is from a paper that John Walvin and I uh, wrote in uh, 2009, and we were interested in this phenomenon of losing memory of fish. About you know, like it's a concept that Daniel Pauly 
wrote about in 1995 called the shifting baseline phenomenon. I'm sure um, none of you escaped from my class. Anyway, I took my class uh, without knowing about it. Um, but it's uh, basically saying that we sort of have a baseline of where we set our normalcy and then go from there. And so uh, when I was asked uh, to uh, peer review a stock assessment of SHAD in 2007, they were showing these data as sort of the baseline, and this is kind of as far back as they went. And in fact, I think I've even found one uh, record in the New York Times. New York Times used to actually report a lot of fisheries information, and they would actually come and attend the American Fishery Society meeting in New York City. Um, so I found a statistic that I added into this data set. But then um, one of the people, or some of the other data that were sort of floating around got me curious, and I actually talked to people in the ASMSC uh, technical group and um, found out that there were actually data that were observed from um, Fisher's uh, log books in um, the Potomac River in uh, the early 1800s. And uh, so the data that are shown, I think, are only from one fisherman uh, that takes that, date, that baseline back. But there you have it. So it's kind of an indication that this is, this is sort of from one family's log book um, that there was probably a whole lot more uh, fishing, uh, ab abundance of fish at that time. So we can see that the baseline very, very clearly shifted, even in the 1800s. Okay, so thinking about, thank you, Bobby, thinking about the, he said I needed a watershed slide, so here it is. Uh, for the Hudson, local context, this is the golden slide that, that Bobby is going to talk about later. But this is, um, uh, uh, let's see, so this is a little bit before I, let's see, this is a little bit before I met the DEC people, but then I started to get friendly with them and then started getting into my thesis work and things looked okay, but then things started to get a little crazy in my postdoc years. And then all of a sudden I got a job at ESF and oh my God, what happened? <laughs> And you can see that under, what was it, three, three, three years running, action needs to be taken if you, if you follow the red line. Almost came back in 2014, but not quite. So the question really is, what has happened? This looks a whole lot like a regime shift to me. The other regime shift that people who are familiar with the Hudson River ecology know is that they, um, is that in uh, 1992, uh, or 1991, zebra mussels were, were found in the Hudson by Chris Nack's grandfather, and uh, by 1992 they were spread all over the place, and when you look at the chlorophyll records, they just, it's like the lights, the lights go out, uh, and it's a switch like that too. However, that happened back here, so it's not the same, it's not leading into that. So uh, what happened is the question, what could have caused this? It does look like a regime shift to me. Could it have been set in place a long time ago um, by an accumulation of factors. And so that's the, this is kind of the direction that Bobby was going in with, with his uh, musings. And so trying to think about that, you know, what's been going on, of course, is that people have colonized this region for uh, about, well, people have been here for about 10,000 years, but have colonized it sort of in a more exponential way since the European invasion, as it were, and it's about 500 years. And so there have been things that have happened, a lot of land and water alterations. My husband and I studied that and presented that. Land clearing, deforestation, a lot of you who study salmon know that's a bad thing. Agriculture, um, which was there to produce the food. Um, reworking of the river morphology, quite a bit of work has been done on that by Dan Miller uh, in the Hudson uh, River, uh, river Estuary Program. Damming, which is a theme we've heard about today and we'll hear more about. And gross pollution, you know, you sort of have this feeling that, that I mean, it gets a lot of play. So it probably has something to do with it and we've controlled a lot of that now. So, <coughs> excuse me, I talked too much last night. Um, and so, um, uh, but it's, it's probably, it has been an issue and something that could have affected things. Invasive species. <coughs> and then the great specter of climate change. 
So sort of going running through all of that, uh, some of the if we reconstruct the changes that go over time, this gives um, this is based mostly on this paper I did with my husband and my student <coughs> uh, Stanbrook. And so as I said, about ten thousand years of um, indigenous use, which uh, definitely had impacts, but probably not impacts that were so large and profound as they are today is my guess, although we do know that Native Americans uh, really worked the land and the water um, to, uh, to optimize their own resource use. Um, and so then, approximately 400, 500 years of non-indigenous <coughs> use, one of the first things that happened when uh, the Europeans came is that they used the river, they colonized the river starting at Manhattan and started cu cutting down trees and making, building sawmills and milled the wood and built their houses and then they would move the mills further inland and up river and so on. Um, and so that, and then that open land was used for uh, farming and industry. So uh, logging in the Hudson has a long history but it sort of got industrialized in the um, in sort of in, in uh, the 1800s, late 1800s. And uh, so these are just some images from a history of, um, of uh, forestry um, uh, in, the, in New York State and in the Adirondacks in particular. And these are just some interesting pictures showing the kinds of uh, logging practices that were done. This is shooting logs down the river and so on. <clears throat> and uh, sawmills. And there was actually a lot of very inefficient uh, harvesting, which left a lot of brush around. I'm not sure that's the next picture. This is actually uh, so it's a couple of slides from here. But <clears throat> there was also a lot of basically um, monotypic uh, clear cutting uh, in places for the hemlock tanning industry. <clears throat> uh, after the tanning uh, industry moved out of New England, it moved westward, hit New York State <clears throat> and the Catskills in the early 1800s. The tanneries uh, produced a great amount of filth and pollution and, <clears throat> uh, and so uh, polluted the rivers that they were on, the tributaries they were on, and changed the forest, the nature of the forest. So the forest ecologists spent a lot of time looking at the legacy of those changes. But as I said, the inefficiency of uh, logging actually led to a lot of forest fires, which combined with a um, uh, a series of droughts, I guess, and fire cycle in the early 20th century, uh, such that <clears throat> there were a lot of an inordinate number of fires that happened in the Adirondacks, and actually uh, was reported that it sort of it was realized that this was threatening the water supply too. <clears throat> so, uh, could for, with better forest practices, were started to be implemented. Um, this I can't even remember what this was about, except I think it's to say that. Uh, this was uh, just showing that forest product uh, shifted, but also, ooh, going fast, okay. <laughs> uh, forest products actually uh, 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 cha changed, I forgot, it was not a half an hour talk, right? Okay, agriculture changed. <laughs> agriculture increased and then uh, started to um, be replaced. So the <coughs> fraction of that changes too. So agriculture and forestry quickly through that part. Yep, okay. <laughs> Geomorphology, a lot of dredging and filling. Talked to Dan Miller about this. But this is just an example showing uh, the changes here from having distinct islands to having masses now that connect to the land. Where's Shad Island, for example? Dams. <laughs> <coughs> Dams, we know, grew the economy. They were very important, but we also know that they are legacy. And finally, in the Hudson Valley, we have a conversation about which ones we ought to be thinking about taking out. Sewage also, <coughs> other stressors seem to have had their uh, time on the stage, as it were. People in this room, may, some of you may remember there was a lot of sewage, and some of you may remember that PCBs were the issue that gripped the community. Now that seems to be getting sort of resolved. Power plants also sort of getting resolved, another issue for me. Invasives. <clears throat> so all of these are factors, right? And the changing predator field. Uh, again, a lot of fish that have been introduced, all of these things change. 
changing life history parameters, pay attention here to uh, number 10 and 11, just to show that um, here was a, a percent of repeat spawners in 1984 in the Hudson by 96, and it dropped quite a bit. I don't know what it is now. Uh, but also 11 is the Connecticut River, which experienced a great change in that as their, um, dam their fish passage was highly inefficient. I think they've been tweaking that up. So I don't know what the current numbers are on that. This is uh, just an example of uh, a depensatory effect over in France on the Alashad. Um, they're showing that you can actually lose species. <coughs> uh, you can lose, lose species in an open system. I'm not going to get into that because I don't have time. And finally, I actually think that these all maybe conspire with climate change itself. If you manage to get these two, these are uh, spring and fall um, trial data from the Northeast Fishery Science Center, a similar data set to what <coughs> Janet and I showed. <coughs> and what you'll see is from 1968 till about 2005 or so, there's some mix, but now you're starting to see a big move into the Gulf of Maine. So uh, this only goes up to 2014. I can just play it one more time. Oh, I guess I can. Um, <laughs> time's up. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so I think that all of these things may combine possibly <coughs> to, uh, and it's a question. I mean, I don't think any of us have the real answer at this point. So this was really just a set of questions and and factors that possibly may contribute. So I think did I end on time more or less? <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> One question.